Hi everyone, I'm Stephanie Weaver. Welcome back to the Blue and Yellow Kitchen. In each episode, I make a dish inspired by a new book while talking to its author. Today's book is The Arsonist City, and I'm making makluba, upside down spiced rice with lamb and vegetables, and it is delicious. I'd like to welcome Hala Alyan, author of The Arsonist City. Hi Hala, how are you? Hi, I'm good, how are you? Good, we're so glad to have you in the kitchen with us. So tell us what the book's about. And um, is there is the arsonist real or metaphorical? There are a little bit of both. There are definitely some unintentional arsonists, but it's mostly talking about kind of the the role of fire, the role that fire has played in protests in different parts of the world. Um, but there are some literal fires that are set by family members. So it's essentially two stories told simultaneously. One is in the past, and one is in present day Beirut. Um, and the one in the past centers around a Syrian woman in the 60s and 70s who's coming of age and really wants to move to Hollywood and become an, like a, a star. Um, and she kind of becomes interested in someone that lives in Lebanon and neighboring Beirut um, during the Civil War and kind of gets caught up in a bunch of events that end up with her moving to California. but in a very different um, way than she had planned and her life kind of taking a sharp left turn. And then the present day story is her and her husband and their now adult children going to Beirut to try to stop the, the husband from selling the house. So it's the family home in Beirut. So the, exactly. the past story centers around this house, the son yes. of that family, the son of the housekeeper. So there's a love triangle yes. and, um, which all, I loved all of it so much. Um, so what, Thank you. Yeah, what inspired you to write this book and how did you choose the setting? You're familiar with Beirut from your family? Yeah, so I lived, I've lived in Lebanon for eight years um, and went to, of those eight years, went to the American University in Beirut for my undergrad. Um, so, and then we have gone back and forth. Um, like I visit Lebanon usually once or twice a year. Every now and then I'll skip a year, but pretty regularly since I've moved away. Um, so I knew that I had wanted to write something that took place in that region. And the plot was actually the woman, Mazna, who's sort of the core, like the matriarch, the one that wants to be an actress, the one that comes of age in Damascus. Um, I had a dream around the time that I was finishing up with my first novel where I just sort of dreamt the, the essentially the plot of Mazna's story. Um, this woman in Syria, deeply, deeply wanting to leave, um, loving to be on stage, loving performing, and then kind of getting married and starting to have children in her life, you know, ending up very different than she had intended. Um, and I woke up kind of like frantically looking for a pen and paper and just sort of word vomited like 10 pages, just everything that I could remember. And then I, I just thought I would come back and write a short story based on that. Um, and then kind of went back to salt houses, was doing the edits, was getting ready for publication. And about a year and a half later, started thinking about what I wanted to work on for my next project and just kept coming back to this like really vivid image of this woman that I had dreamt about um, and knew that I wanted her to be a core part of it. Well, that's also awesome. So your first novel was called The, Sa the Salt Houses. So that's what you were... Salt Houses, yeah. Yeah, what you were referring to. Um, yeah. And so is there anything else readers need to know to prepare them uh, that you want to... It's a good question. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess, you know, it's one of those things where I, I definitely give some plot, like, you know, give, fill in some of the plot just in terms of the sociopolitical situation, in terms of the Lebanese civil war and kind of the relationship sometimes fraught and sometimes close between Lebanon and Syria and just that region in general. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I do imagine that readers who have no knowledge of the background might at some point have to do like a quick, a quick Google search about a few things. But but I think for the most part, it's pretty covered in the narrative. Yeah, so I'm, I'm one of those readers. I knew nothing about Syria or Lebanon and um, mainly just kind of had the Middle East as sort of an amorphous blob in my mental map of the right. Middle East. Right, right, right. Um, I would have just said, well, I love Middle Eastern food, but I wouldn't have been able to right. tell you like which country was Syria, which was Lebanon. I did right. Google the map because I was trying to figure out how far of a drive it was when they were driving back and forth right. and really right, kind right, of right. trying to understand. But it's not hard work. This is just a beautiful story with super rich, detailed characters. Um, the one thing I would say, um, 
with any cross-cultural reading that I have found really helpful is to not be afraid to make a little cheat sheet with the names and who the people yes. are. Yes, um, totally. Because the totally. names are not familiar to me. I'm reading in a different culture. And the one that kept throwing me off is the son's nickname is Mimi, which is a female name in English. So I kept mm-hmm. having to remind myself, Mimi's a man, Mimi's a man. <laughs> so then I finally just made a little cheat sheet. So that's my little tip if when you're reading cross-culturally, which I highly recommend because I learned so much about the region. Instead of it just being sort of this war-torn, sad area, now it's you've really brought it to life for me. So I want to thank, thank you for you. that. Thank you. Oh, God, I really appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. absolutely. Well, so the recipe I'm making today is authentic to the region. It's from Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, and Jordan. Everyone, my understanding is everyone makes it a little bit differently. Everyone's mother makes it the best is what I'm hearing. <laughs> <laughs> and I've researched and made it about six times for this because it's it's not that it's difficult. It's a bit of a time-consuming thing, but there are some tricky aspects to the method that I, I will detail so you'll see my full recipe mm. and steps um, on my blog. Um, so it's authentic. It's just that I've kind of updated it in terms of method so it won't fail if you do try to make it. Um, And so we chose it because it's in the first scene of the book in the prologue, and it's also very common in Beirut. So Hala and I talked about what she thought I should make, and then she really loved this. It's also featured in Judy Kala's beautiful book, Palestine on a Plate. So that was the first place, the first one that I tried, and then I worked on some other recipes from some blogs, which and one of them I'll share in the comments, so you can go check out her. Hungry Paprikas has a beautiful blog. Um, So... Um, right before, so Hal is about to read, but what I'm going to do, so this is an upside down dish, and that means I'm flipping this thing. So I am going to put it there. Can you see it? Oh my this God. Micro- this is very boy. exciting. You can see it? Drum roll. Okay. Oh my God. All right. Hey. I'm going to set it down. I didn't spill it, so that's good. And then I'm just going to, you just kind of let it sit there yeah. uh, so it can settle. So Hal, um, set up uh, the recipe. Uh, I'm sorry, set, set up the, what you're going to read, and then go ahead and read for us. I was going to say, uh, I don't know if I can set up the recipe. I don't cook. No, no, yes, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Hala was no help with the recipe research. So. I was zero assistance. Zero assistance. assistance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she, she did, um, she did tell, tell me how to pronounce it properly, but that was as much as she was all, in. That was the extent. That, that was, was the extent, extent of it, yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, I live on Seamless. Okay, so I... <laughs> Uh, so the setup here is so Mesna is the is the Syrian woman who you know comes of age in Damascus and really wants to move to Hollywood and become a star. Um, in the seventies, she just through a, a, a series of random events ends up meeting meeting a Lebanese man named Idris and a Palestinian man named Zakaria. And their relationship to each other is that they grew up together, but kind of in unusual circumstances in that Zakaria's mother was Idris's family's housekeeper. Um, so they come from very different, he lives in the Palestinian camps, they come from very different worlds and socioeconomic backgrounds, but are very close. They become very close with Mezna too, so she kind of becomes the third in their little group. Um, and over the course of a few months and into a summer, in the 70s during the war, they spend, they're kind of inseparable, the three of them. Um, and there's there's some falling in love that's happening from Mezna's end towards Zakaria, and unfortunately from Idris's end towards Mezna. So there's a little bit of a love triangle thing going on. So this is them on a trip to, so again, this is Mezna on a trip to Beirut, um, where she is meeting a, a woman that's, that's important, a middle-aged woman that's important to both of them. Great. This neighborhood is decidedly grungy. Many of the storefronts are graffitied with smiley faces and slurs, and a few barefoot children are playing marbles. At the end of the street, they turn left and into these stops. Mazna looks up. They are standing in front of a tiny bakery, a sign in Arabic announcing Didi's sugar. What's this, she asks. Idris smiles enigmatically. There's someone I'd like you to meet. He pushes open the door, a bell tinkles, and Mesna sees it's dangling from a dirty-looking rope. The store is roughly the size of her bedroom. The rough tiles are concrete gray, and the ceiling is covered in water stains, but the glass display is sparklingly clean. There are rows of pink iced eclairs and cream puffs and cakes. The smell is incredible. Nobody is behind the counter, though Mesna can hear someone in the back. This place was a famous bakery before the war, Idris whispers. Really? He nods. 
My father is an old friend of the owner. As if on cue, a large woman wearing a red apron appears from the back. Her arms jiggle with appealing girth. She has one of the prettiest faces Mesna has ever seen, round and unlined with hazel eyes. There's a streak of flower in her salt and pepper hair. Good Allah in his plush purple chair, she cries out at the sight of Idris. What are you doing here? Idris vanishes in her embrace. I missed you, he says, his voice muffled. I brought my friend. Mesna, he calls out. Meet Didi. Didi releases Idris and smiles at Mesna. Welcome, welcome, she says. Eclair or, or mille feu. Mesna places a hand on her stomach. I'm all right, thank you. I Nonsense, your air and bones. Didi slides an eclair onto a paper doily and hands it to Mesna. Nowhere in the world smells this good, Idris says appreciatively. Didi turns to Idris, fists on hips. Just to see old Didi, huh? She says jokingly. Is he here? Didi smiles. Zuzu, she hollers. Some customers for you. She winks at Mazna, whose stomach inexplicably knocks with the nerves. A door is slamming, the sound of footsteps. A man emerges from the back room. The first person he sees is her, and he smiles politely, thinking her a customer. Mazna feels her breath catch at her throat like a champagne bubble. He is tall and lithe and wearing a white apron. His beard is thicker than Idris's, and he looks unmistakably poor, though she feels awful at the thought. Idris says his name, and Zakaria turns away from her. Idi, he shouts. In three long-legged strides, he's at Idris's side, bear-hugging him like Didi. Mazna's mind hums with detective work. Idris doesn't visit often. There's something special about him dropping in. Then the men kiss each other on the cheek. She catches Didi's eye, and the older woman winks. Me, she fi- she's surprised to find herself slightly urging Zakaria. Look at me. And he does. He releases Idris with a final clap on the back and turns towards Mesna, a reserved smile on his lips. So, he says, like they're old friends. Mesna smiles too, unnerved. She feels like she's about to go on stage. I'm Mesna. Ooh, and so the love triangle begins. And so it begins. <laughs> oh, it's a beautiful passage. And I can think you can see, yeah. those of you watching, why I just adored this book. The language is so beautiful. Everyone Thank is just you. so alive. And, um, and, there, and it's just a very rich story. So... We're gonna see how this how this came out this magluba. So I'm gonna oh. I'm gonna try to not spill it over everything. All right. So we're gonna see. Can you see it on micro? I can see it. Yeah. Okay. Ooh, 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 ooh. <gasps> oh, that's beautiful. Oh, look at that! I did it. That is beautiful. So I don't I don't know if you can see. So the way that you form it, I'm gonna hold it back so you can see a little bit. Um, and I'll set it down because uh, it is it is hefty. Um, yeah. So there's roasted tomatoes, roasted bell peppers. There's a layer of roasted potatoes. Very commonly, it's made with eggplant, and the vegetables are fried. But what I learned from multiple times times trying it is that if you're making the lamb stock, which and then there's a layer of lamb and onions, um, that takes an hour. So you can actually just slice all the vegetables and spritz them and brush them with olive oil and be roasting them while the lamb stock is cooking. Mm. Soak the rice for 30 minutes. That's the biggest tip um, because sometimes the rice does not cook through. So if the rice has been soaked and then you use hot broth, it comes out like this Um, and not, uh, I'll have a reel up on Instagram in a couple days and you'll see all the times it didn't come out like this because I, we recorded all of them. (laughs) Um, So it's just incredibly fragrant and um, the lamb is cooked with bay leaves and cinnamon stick, allspice and peppercorns. And so it's just this really fragrant broth that then perfumes and seasons the rice. And then you add just some turmeric. Not everybody does, but I just think the color is so beautiful with the turmeric. Mm. So Hala, when you've had this, um, do they use parsley and yogurt and um, sliced almonds as a sort of seasonings or toppings or, yeah yeah okay yeah totally yeah you i mean you have it with the with the yogurt for sure that's okay. definitely on the side okay on the side all right cool yeah so i'm just sprinkling a little of those things on there so i've got some 
a little bit of parsley from my garden, a little bit of, I did do, um, toasted some sliced almonds. And then would you drizzle the yogurt over or on the side, you said? So on the side, meaning like um, when you're serving it, right? So you would serve it okay. with like some of the rice and the meat and okay. the vegetables and then a dollop of the, or like a spoonful of the yogurt. Okay. And then you kind of mix it all together. Oh, okay. All right. So I'll save that because I have to photograph it, but I'm going to go ahead and taste it off the back side here. Um, I'll just do a little quick taste. Oh, it sounds delicious. Mm. The lamb is so tender. It's just mm. unbelievable. And it's, you can taste the spices, but they're very subtle. So you, you might think, oh, it's going to be too much cinnamon or, oh, it's going to be too much pepper. Um, but you remove all of those. So you have a nice right. clear broth and that's what you cook the rice in. And it's really fun because you, you never really know what it's going to look like because things kind of shift around a little bit as it's cooking. But the idea is that it's layered with the vegetables. The rice is super tender and, um, and the, and the tip to getting it to mold like this is to let it sit for at least an hour after it finishes mm. cooking. Um, that was not the case with all of the instructions online, but um, one person on Instagram basically w like went out for a run and came back two hours later and hers was, and I was like, oh, I'm gonna try that next time. So I'm not sure how it's made, you know, in, in, in Beirut uh, necessarily, mm -hmm. but if you want it to look like this, this is, uh, this is what I did. Okay, great. So, um, super delicious, and um, the very first scene, which you, I would recommend coming back and reading when you get to the end of the book, because it mm. sets up sort of things that happen, but you sort totally. of, once, once you get into the modern day story, you kind of have forgotten about the prologue, and it's really right. good to come back and read it, and this is what his mother has made for him, uh, yeah. Zachary's his mother has made for him, so um, that's why I wanted to kind of set that up. Okay, so... Um, how does your mom make it? Like, does she, what do you know? What vegetables or your grandmother would she would use? It's or? usually, I mean, usually like a lot of eggplants. I okay. mean, I, I think that the way that I, I don't know if it's I want to say the way that Palestinians make it, but to be totally honest with you, I don't know if it's like a difference in the countries or if it's kind of a difference in your house and like what you're like you're saying. What did? How did your grandmother cook it? How did your great grandmother cook it? Um, but usually in my in my house, it was it was really mostly eggplants. I don't actually remember, maybe sometimes some sliced tomatoes, um, but usually, yeah, mostly just like eggplant and rice and like the meat. And there are variations where like people swap out the lamb for the chicken. And there's obviously in this day and age, there's like vegan matlube and there, you know, there's all sorts of stuff, but we definitely did it mostly with eggplants. For sure. Yeah, so I've seen vegetarian versions. I've made it once with mm -hmm. chicken just to try it out. Um, so, and I'm a, the person that if I'm gonna make something this elaborate, I want all my vegetables in the same dish. <laughs> yeah, so I, so I, I kind of totally load agree. up yes. all the vegetables in there. So I would say it's authentic in the sense of it's layered and it has mm -hmm. many elements that are uh, true, um, but every family makes it differently. And I'm sure there may be people who are completely horrified that I didn't fry the vegetables. Um, <laughs> but that's just a you know, that's just something that's not easy for me to do in my lifestyle, right, right, but it's right, very right. easy for me to throw them in the oven with some olive oil on them and they come out delicious and then they're ready right. to go. So it just felt like that would make it sort of a little bit more convenient to make. And I have to say, just because I don't know if the, 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 the viewers are going to understand this, like the fact that you were able to do that flip and keep the form so perfectly is like enormous. Yay! Like, that's like, that's a huge, huge deal. Yeah. <laughs> well, like I said, many, many trials. Um, I was, it was well worth it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, and it's very exciting because it is really fun, but you have to, you, you flip it over, you let it sit and the gravity just kind of slides it down. Um, right. I have a bu I'll have a bunch of tips in the blog about pans and shape and all that because there's it, it's more complicated than I was expecting, but the <laughs> results have been phenomenal and it is a dish I will continue to make because we love it so much. So thank you so much Amazing. for introducing me to it. It's so My great. My pleasure. Absolutely. So thank you, Hala. Thank you so much for being here today. You'll find the of recipe course. link in the Facebook video or on my website, migraineleliefrecipes.com. Learn more about Hala at halaalyan.com. And if you enjoyed the show, please share it with a friend. Order a copy of The Arsonist City wherever you like to buy books. If you aren't able to buy books, you can support an author by asking your local library to order a copy because that does help us as well. 
Follow me at SWeaverMPH so you don't miss an episode and join us next time for another author interview in addition inspired by their book. Thanks so much for watching The Blue and Yellow Kitchen. <laughs>